in activity for a lot of people, the ability to mitigate uh, your damage. Uh, and the part, the part of the problem here is uh, it goes to the, let's, let's call this the main mantra, mantra of wetland law in our country right now, is no net loss. So this idea of no net loss, which I, I believe, was, my memory serves me right, was promulgated during the first uh, Bush administration. Uh, and the idea was, well, you know, we, we've got to develop, we've got to do stuff, so rather than say no wetlands will be filled, we'll just say no net loss, so you can fill a wetland, but we'll let you either recreate, we'll let you recreate another wetland over here, okay? You can build another wetland. So, you know, it sounds like a good idea, but let's, let's just think about that a little bit. So here is a landscape, one of these prairie pothole landscapes, very complex. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how these came to be. But you can see there's every gradation here of wetness from very wet to very dry and everything in between. Now you know, you all know that wetlands perform a certain anatomical function. Is that right? Do any of you know which, if, you, if, the, if the earth is a body, then the wetlands are the? Kidneys. They are the kidneys, that's right. Now the kidneys, you know, the ones we often hear about, you know, you knock down the tree, the trees are what? the lungs. Now the kidneys, you know, they don't, they're not quite as sexy as the lungs, right? Not quite. But would you be any less dead without your kidneys than with your lungs? Might take you a few more days, right? But you would be dead. So let's think about that then in terms of the anatomy here. So here's a nice kidney here. And think about that in terms of mitigation. So mitigation is you, you zap the wetland and you build another one. So the question here is, would you rather have uh, one real good kidney or two fake ones? Does that, does, that, I don't, does that make kind of sense? You see my drift here? Get that, Tim? You got that? Just, you know. But that's what we're looking at, right? So I, I guess what I'm saying is, no net loss has kind of blinded us a little bit here sort of an, a, a little bit of a false accounting that we can go ahead and we'll, we'll do this no net loss, yeah, it, but it just comes down to acres. Oh, you destroyed 500 acres, well, I got another 500 acres, maybe I even got 1,000. But they are not the same as this. There is nobody out there anywhere. There is no mitigation artist, no mitigation company that is going to build this. They are not going to do that. They are going to take a bulldozer. They might shape it a little bit, make it a little fancy, okay? But they are not going to build anything near this complex. So the way it's set up right now is, we're happy to get rid of all these guys and just get a few uh, of these other kinds of wetlands and in limited places. There's only so many mitigation banks. They are in limited places. They are not all over the place like the wetlands are. So I think this is a serious issue that we need to think about, and it's, it's, it's part of some ongoing studies that I've involved that I'll, that I'll address, address uh, briefly here. So let's get back to that 404 process. There's some leakage in the process that we should be aware of. It doesn't always work perfectly. Number one is no permit. You might not realize this, but there is a, a lot of people who develop wetlands develop and they don't even go for a permit. Now nobody has ever really quantified this, but my guess it's anywhere from a third to two thirds of all the development that happens occurs without the benefit of any kind of a permit. The core does not proactively go out and check on stuff. They don't have people out there. If you go build a building anywhere in any county, in any city, in this area, you will have a building permit. I will guarantee you, you will have a, the very few people. Somebody maybe in the backyard puts a little shanty up or something. Maybe they don't go for a permit. But if you build a building, if you build a house, there will be inspectors. They will come around and they will fine you, right? They will fine you. But the core will not come around. 
They have no proactive means of going around. They really don't have the wherewithal. They don't have enough people. We'll give them that credit for sure. But that's just the way the system is. Nobody is going to go around. So there are a considerable amount of wetlands that are being filled and not being uh, permitted. There are what we call the tight delineations. This is a master of tight delineations told me this, a famous lawyer who's involved with wetland issues. Uh, so tight delineation just means you make it as small as you can. The delineation is what happens, a, a consultant will go out, the, the uh, uh, developer is gonna have, do a, fill a wetland, they have, to get, they have to make a map of those wetlands. So that's called a delineation. And so what you do is you get somebody who draws a very tight line. Now I have my shingle out, I'm a wetland person. I have my name in the list of the people who do wetland delineations. Guess what? Nobody calls me. <laughs> do you know why nobody calls me? Because I don't do tight delineations. I kind of make it a little broader. So I'm just saying the problem here in some sense, and I think, I think wetlands consulting has this more than a lot of other kinds of environmental businesses. Uh, wetland consultants are, should be doing the work of the Corps of Engineers, right? Instead, they're hired by, consult, by, the, by the developers. So you are going to play the tune that the piper, you know, pays you to play, right? So, so uh, you tend to make those delineations very tight. And then the other issue is inadequate or no uh, mitigation. So we've got some studies going on on a variety of these issues, mitigation in particular. But the real problem now, so this is this, I actually made this slide um, quite some years ago, uh, prior to SWANK. I'm gonna talk about what SWANK means in just a minute. But the major linkage now is no jurisdiction. Most of these wetlands, the vast majority of the wetlands in our area on this coastal plain do not fall under the jurisdiction of the Corps anymore. So all of this stuff I was talking about is irrelevant anyway because they weren't going to uh, exert jurisdiction. They weren't going to claim them as coming under the Clean Water Act. And that is a result of a couple of uh, Supreme Court cases. Bob alluded to that just briefly. Uh, one of them was called SWANK, the, the uh, Solid Waste Agency of Northern Cook County. A very important case, I think that was either 2000 or 2001. And the Corps actually uh, was involved in that. Uh, they were actually saying that a certain uh, gravel pit close to Chicago should be regulated. And that gravel pit was just a steep gravel pit with no real hydrologic connection to anything. It was just, it was an artificial wetland from the get-go. And the Corps said, well, we're, gonna, we're, still gonna, we're still going to regulate this wetland because there's birds that fly up here and they come from Texas, they come from Missouri, so it's interstate birds, and they come over here and they land on this wetland. So therefore, we are going to exert jurisdiction. Well, the, the uh, Supreme Court looked at that, they listened and they said, well, that's a mighty fine argument you got there, but this is the Clean Water Act. This is not the Migratory Bird Act. And so they said, we're not going to let you do that. So they, they uh, struck down uh, that, that particular case, but what that did is it caused the core here, our local core, which is based in Galveston, to uh, change how they'd been doing things. Before that time, they had both isolated wetlands and uh, adjacent wetlands. They used those terms. It, it didn't matter a whole lot pre-Swank, but after Swank, they said, well, what we've been calling isolated, that's it. We're not gonna regulate those anymore. We don't see those as being connected. And so right now, they say any wetland that is not connected via a, a channelized connection, like a bed and banks, you know, a, a easy to see big channel, or it's not in a floodplain, we're not regulating it. So that, so since 2000 or 2001, most of our wetlands, so when you think about all the, all the development that occurred leading up to the Great Recession, just acres and acres and acres of uh, development, none of that was mitigated at all. And then in, in 2007, we had the Rapinos case, uh, Rapinos Carabel case, pretty much the same thing, but uh, in this case, they, it was a little bit of a nuance. Uh, they made appeal to something called the significant nexus. Uh, and this legal doctrine actually 
runs through the Arapanos case, the Swank case, and then there was another case called the Bayview case. So those are sort of the three major cases. The thing with wetlands is that it's all through Supreme Court rulings. There's no real, it's not all codified you know, by Congress. It's sort of just the courts have been taking care of it. So the interesting thing about Rapidos was it was a 4-1-4 ruling. It's a three-way split. And the, so four of them said, you know, if it floats a duck all the time, that's a wetland. Okay, those were the most conservative. The other four said, nah, if it gets wet sometime, even if it's seasonal, we still think it should be regulated. And then the guy in the middle, Justice Kennedy, he said, well, I kind of agree with both sides. But if you can use science and you can demonstrate and you can quantify that connection between those wetlands that are what, kind of what we call headwater wetlands, if you can quantify that connection, if you can demonstrate it for a class of wetlands, then those wetlands can be regulated. So that was a significant difference. And that opened the door for us, okay? So I and a team at A&M and then a ba another Baylor team came together and we said, you know what? We're gonna, we are gonna quantify that. We've seen this connection. We're gonna go out and we're gonna take some data. And we did that and I will talk about that briefly. So um, just a little bit, I wanna just a little bit on how our wetlands came to be. I probably should have placed this a little bit different in this uh, presentation, but uh, our wetlands are so special. They are so unique. And all of our wetlands here are, are, are based uh, in one way or another on rivers. This area that we live on was all laid down by rivers. Where we are right here was laid down by the Brazos River some 30,000 years ago. Brazos River is quite a ways away. If we dug down here, you'd find those same kind of buff red color that you see over there in Sugarland. And the two big formations that we have here are the Beaumont Formation and the Lissy Formation. These are sediments that were laid down. The Beaumont is about 30,000 years old. The Lissy is some 100,000 plus years old. So they're still flat. They haven't been dissected. It's the original terrain has just been sitting there. You go up here, you get up on your way to College Station, you know, up about Hempstead. You know, you, I don't know if you know when you're driving up there. You come to Waller, there's this nosebleed, have you noticed, as all of a sudden the road kind of starts going up. I mean, I just, you know, start shaking every time I go up there. <laughs> really, it's, it's, it's tough. Uh, but those areas up there, the land has tilted, those sediments have tilted so much that it's all been eroded. And so up there, when water comes down, it knows where to go and it goes where it needs to go. Whereas on these formations here, it doesn't know where to go. So the interesting thing then is, uh, this is a shuttle shot showing, we, we call these, we don't call them deltas, we call them fluvio deltaic plains because the river went across this large plain and it would jump ship every once in a while as a whole channel. It's not like a delta like the uh, Mississippi is, where you have sort of multiple distributary channels. You all know about rivers. They've got uh, a variety of features. The rivers are always moving around, right? You've got the, you've got the uh, uh, levees, the oxbow lakes, the back swamps. It's always, it's always slicing and dicing the landscape. This is the, uh, uh, this is up, this is the Trinity River up near Dallas. And this is just, this is like looking like a landscape that is just 500 years old, maybe a thousand years old at the most. So in that thousand years, you can see that that river has moved back and forth, right? You can see the actual channel today. This is that little arrow showing up? Yeah. So then you can see the river came here, it came here. So it's actually, it cuts across and it slices over itself again, right? Kind of slicing and dicing that landscape up. And that's what makes these uh, environments so uh, interesting. So if we look here in our area, this is a geologic map of the Clear Lake area. And uh, this is a Clear Lake here. So that's the current drainage. This is what we call a meander ridge, an ancient meander ridge of the Brazos River, very far away from the Brazos River. But during the ice ages, that's where that river flowed. Okay, and you can see the old channel there. Uh, so that's where the biggest wetlands are in this ancient channel. Now it's no longer a complete channel all the way down, but even here it had a name, it was called Magnolia Creek. Most of it's gone now. There's at least a subdivision that was named for it, it's Magnolia Creek. I mean, you know, we got that, right? You know, so 
didn't lose at all. Um, but there's still, so if you look here, so here's a photo. So I'm gonna see, if you look at this little, let's see, where am I going here? Yeah, so see this little guy right here? Little bitty channel scar, an ancient channel scar. And then if you look at this aerial photo here, here it is, so here's Highway 96. Here's that, these are those houses. I remember I showed you in that picture of the wetland and the houses. That's those houses there. And here's this ancient channel scar right there. So a channel scar from 30 to 50,000 years ago. And in the ensuing 30 to 50,000 years, the wind has blown and we get the little pimple mounds over there. The mastodons have stomped, changed the landscape, and the buffalo have roamed and wallowed all in this landscape. So it makes this sort of a landscape melody over time that's irreplaceable, kind of a chance melody that cannot be replaced because of all the time that it took to get where it is. So we can look at these things all over the place. This one's down in Victoria. Here's a current, uh, current channel draining the landscape. Uh, this area would be called the back swamp, so the lower areas, you know, the rivers always have a levee on their side, right? That's these meander ridges, and then off the, to the distance are what we call the back swamps. That's where the clays are uh, that crack your foundations, these gumbo clays. So here's up on this ancient meander ridge. You can see the complexity here. You know, here's a, here's a channel. Uh, you can't, it, it's been so long, you can't really even, sometimes you can make out the channel, sometimes you can't but you can see the pimple mounds are out there. It's an extremely complex uh, landscape. Uh, here's one that's uh, in the Clear Lake area. Uh, this is just uh, east of Ellington Field. Uh, you can see the original channel is still there. All of this is a wetland. And then most uh, Yopon and whatnot have kind of colonized these uh, uh, pimple mounds here. So it's a very complex landscape. Well, you can see that it's pretty easy to see those uh, uh, pimple